haven't seen any of these before. Oh, I love this. This means that you might, you're enjoying it. I'm glad you want to collect. 37 uh, artists are in my series, 36 artists are in my series now. So, and that's why I give you those handouts so you can keep track, like see what you're missing. Okay, let's get started. During Modigliani's very short and difficult life, the going rate for his elegant, oddly distorted paintings was less than $10. And takers were few, he couldn't even give them away. A landlord who confiscated some of his work instead of rent used the canvases to patch up old mattresses. This one, Nude Sitting on a Divan by, Michael, by Modigliani, sold in 2010 for $68.9 million. And in February of 2013, an anonymous bidder at Sotheby's Auction House in New York City paid $42.1 million for an Eberturn portrait. This one's called Au Cha Chapeau. One of the many ironies of Modigliani's career is that such a tortured life could produce such a serene body of work. His art managed to bridge the stylistic gap between classical Italian painting and avant-garde modernism. The French poet Jean Cocteau, writing in 1959, some 40 years after the two had hobdobbed in Paris in the Montmartre cafes, called Modigliani the simplest and noblest genius of this heroic age. Yet, conventional art historians barely mention him. Studied art history for six years. Not once did we come across Modigliani. Look at some of your old history books. I think it's hard to pigeonhole him within the canon of 20th century painting, and maybe that's why he's not recognized. And probably more importantly is there's a lot of forgeries on the market. More important, his colorful and tragic life overshadowed his accomplishments as an artist. He was the quintessential suffering artist. He was short, only about five foot five inches tall, but he was dark and handsome, hugely, hugely attractive to women. He was addicted to drink and drugs, and he lived on almost nothing as he starved his way and struggled his way through art as an artist. Amadeo Modigliani was the quintessential suffering artist. And to complete the cliché, he died young, just on the verge of being discovered as an artistic genius. His paintings are so linear and so spare, and so elegant and so very distinctive in style that they can't be mistaken for anything else. When I say Modigliani, I'm sure you think of the elongated necks. As a consequence, they don't really fit into any definitive uh, artistic category. His style is unique to his own creation. And his paintings, which were predominantly portraits and nudes, are instantly identifiable and interesting. Uh, some of his contemporaries are not. Many people mistake Monet's for Renoir's, Degas for Cassatt's. Modigliani, you know Modigliani when you see it. He disliked painting outdoors. He preferred to work inside within the confines of his studio, at a bar, or at a cafe. In fact, he's known to only have painted three landscapes in his life. The majority of his work is semi-formal portraits that radiate this somewhat sculptural quality, suggesting his early roots as a sculptor. How many of you knew that he started out as a sculptor? I want to teach you five new things today, so keep track. Their faces are all expressionless, yet he infuses them with personality in their elongated appearance, but he really scandalized the polite world with his work. His paintings were considered to be far too sensual and were viewed as particularly outrageous because they showed body hair not something that was historically portrayed in a nude. He sold very few paintings or drawings in his lifetime. More often, he would just give them away in exchange for a meal 
or as a token of friendship. And after discovering this modernist style, he, his new modernist style, he destroyed many of his early works because he said they were too academic. Although his work was widely exhibited in France during his lifetime, he never really sold anything. He was an Italian Jew born in the port town of Livorno on the northwestern coast of Tuscany, and he was a dreamy, precocious mama's boy. He was the youngest of four children. He lived in a bohemian but very literate and philosophical household run by his father, Flaminio. He was a small time businessman. He dealt primarily in minerals. And his mother was Eugenia, and she was very strong-minded, an avant-garde school administrator, and she taught uh, classes at home, and she was very strict but also very indulgent. His family was considered to be cultivated and also considered to be left-leaning intellectuals. His father, unfortunately, was a failure in business and was absent for most of Modigliani's childhood. And to make ends meet, his mother, Eugenia, opened a school in the family home, and she taught French and English, among other subjects. So he was a sickly child, and they called him Dido. Uh, he had several bouts with pleurisy at the age of 14, and he almost died of typhoid fever. Two years later, after this uh, incident with the pleurisy and typhoid fever, he was diagnosed with tuberculosis, which would slowly kill him over the next 20 years. He rarely spoke about this condition. He seemed to be aware that it was something that he didn't want people to know. It was a very infectious disease. Uh, and he would announce to, fr to friends that he would seek, above all else, a brief but very intense life. Now, the year before Amadeo was born, his father was bankrupted following a plummet in the price of metals. And as the story goes, the bailiffs were about to remove all the family assets, but there was an ancient law that stated that creditors could not seize the bed of a pregnant woman. Well, his mother was just about to deliver, so the family piled all of their valuables on top of Eugenia's bed, and she actually was in labor at the time. His mother homeschooled him until he was 10, and he was tutored in philosophy and literature by his maternal grandfather, and that led to a lifelong interest in radical thinking and idealism. The family's home was lively, very unconventional. Political views were taken very seriously. In fact, in 1898, Amadeo's eldest uh, brother, Emmanuel, was imprisoned for six months after being convicted of anarchy. Now, he was ever a very strong boy, Amadeo. And when he was about 11, after this attack of pleurisy, it left him very weakened and vulnerable. And that's why he wound up catching typhoid fever. And during that illness, he became delirious, and he raved about the fact that he had wanted to see all of the magnificent Renaissance paintings in Florence someday. And his worried mother said that she would take him if he would get better. And true to her word, she did eventually take him when he recovered. Now, throughout his childhood, he drew and he painted and he showed a great deal of talent as an artist, even in his young teen years. And when he was 14, he was eager to start formal training under Guglielmo Micheli, who was the best local private teacher at the time. And between 1889 and 1900, he learned all of the basics with this kind of a heavy 19th century classical bent. He studied landscape painting, still life, portraiture, life studies, but because he had this incredible infatuation with women, he excelled at painting portraits of them. Art lessons stopped when at the age of 16, he contracted tuberculosis and was too weak to continue with his studies. So instead, in an attempt to rebuild his strength, his mother took him on a lengthy tour to Italy, including Capri, Naples, then to Rome, and the Amalfi Coast. In 
He was entranced by all of the great artists of the Italian Renaissance and the passion that he had uh, for this kind of classical work set him apart from some of his more militant modern peers. He wanted to break new ground, but he still wanted to have this influence of, of the old. At 17, he writes from Venice to a friend of his in Livarno, always speak out, keep forging ahead. The man who cannot find new ambitions or a new person within himself is not truly a man. Now in May of 1902, he leaves home and he moves to Florence where he enrolled in La Scuola Libre de Nuodo, which is a school of fine arts. He stayed there a little under a year before he moved to Venice in March. And then again, he enrolled at the Arts Academy, the Academy della uh, Bella Arti di Venezia, a couple of different schools, never really finished the curriculum, but he was always studying. And Venice was a big turning point for Modigliani's life, but that's when he started drinking heavily. He also started smoking hashish. He devoted less and less time to his studies while he was in these classes in favor of, in his words, experiencing the less reputable aspects of Venetian life. So among his new companions were, <coughs> excuse me, Ardengo Scofici and Umberto Bocconcini. And they were uh, leaders of futurist movement, which was kind of an intellectual artistic movement at the time, short-lived, uh, but on the forefront of this new idea about art. And together, they debated and they caroused, and Modigliani increasingly pursued his own philosophy, which was defiance and disorder is the only way to discover true creativity. Now, after two years of desolate living, he announced that he was going to live in Paris, and it was still the center of the artistic world, in spite of the fact that the city was starting to lose some of its artistic preeminence. And he arrives in uh, Paris in 1906 at the age of 21. He emerges from his second class train compartment wearing a smartly tailored black suit and a dramatic black cape. Although he's very slight, he always looked taller than his five foot five inches, he did carry himself like an aristocrat. In his suitcase, he packed a well-worn edition of Dante, which he would recite from memory at high volume, day or night, especially after he had a few drinks, and a small reproduction of this painting called Two Courtesans, which is a painting by a Venetian Renaissance artist, Vittorio Carpaccio, which he would tack to the walls of his endless succession of rented rooms. He brought enough money from his mom to last him a few months if he was careful, but he was never careful. He initially rented a tiny studio in La Place Jean-Baptiste Clément, and soon he was throw out, thrown out because he couldn't pay his rent. So he moved his few possessions, some old clothes, a few books, some artist materials, and he was always seen around town with a pushcart, with everything that he owned in this pushcart. He was always accompanied by a woman. His first one was Maud Abrante. She was in Montmartre. She moved him into her apartment in this artistic commune called Le Bateau Lavoir. And he maintained the air of sophistication while he lived there, as though he was this impoverished artist, a, an aristocrat that had fallen on hard times. He felt that it was beneath him to do any menial tasks to earn money, like his other artist friends did. So he made friends very easily with women uh, who turned out to be his lovers, and they helped him financially. In Paris, he discovers the work of Pierre Renoir, Edgar Degas, and Paul Gauguin, among the younger artists who were up and coming, uh, and the more radical set like Matisse and Picasso. Cezanne, in particular, was one of his favorite painters. And whenever Cezanne's name was mentioned, he would pull out these, this reproduction of the boy in the red hat out of his vest. He would kiss it, and he'd go, ah, oh, Cezanne. He was an obsessive draftsman. And he would pull out pencil and paper in cafes, in the streets, an exercise that he described as graphic gymnastics. <clears throat> 
And these drawings became critical preliminary drawings to many of his paintings, and he would exchange these sketches for food or goods. Whenever he was short of money, he turned the picture in for maybe a drink. His own early work was somber. The expressionist influence portraits are very rough and they're applied with a choppy brush, a lot of gray green colors, heavy outlining that was borrowed obviously from Cezanne and Toulouse Lautrec who left a great impression on him. So he quickly assumed this pose as the flamboyant bohemian artist and he would hang out in Montmartre where all the artists were, wearing a bright silk scarf, knotted around his neck in, in place of a tie or cravat. And Maurice Utrillo, who you know is the son of, the uh, illegitimate son of Pierre Renoir and Suzanne Valadon, uh, who later became very famous for painting scenes of Montmartre, he was Amadeo Modigliani's favorite drinking companion. Do you remember, did we do Suzanne Valadon here? So when M M Modi was the guy that Maurice Utrillo originally fell in love with, he mistook their friendship for something more. Uh, and Modigliani at this point didn't make things very clear to him, but made, made it clear later in life. So they were drinking companions. Uh, Modigli Modigliani was also friendly with Picasso, although not part of his inner circle. Now he would write about Picasso very often in his letters, and he always called him a working man because Picasso always wore patched clothes, fisherman sweaters, and Picasso always admired Modigliani's wardrobe more than his drawings. Uh, but he also needed canvases, so he would buy Modigliani's canvases for pennies, rinse them off, and then reuse them. Modigliani recognized the Spaniard's genius. It didn't upset him that he bought his canvases just for the paper to be painted on, but he said that's no excuse for not dressing decently of Picasso. Pablo Picasso was among the fellow artists in the community that reluctantly became friends with Modigliani, although they did fall out later because Picasso quoted Modigliani's excessive behavior. So for much of his life, he was better known as a bit of a character rather than a painter in the Montmartre community that he lived in. And he was never afraid to speak his mind. In 1918, he visited the famous Impressionist Pierre-Auguste Renoir, and uh, Pierre Renoir, believing that Modigliani might enjoy some banter, confided to Modigliani that he didn't believe a painting of a nude was finished unless he felt the urge to slap her backside. <laughs> Instead of laughing out loud, Modigliani cut off the conversation by saying, I don't like buttocks. So that's kind of a, his answer is kind of an example of how Modigliani lived on his own terms. He was even ready to shut down uh, Pierre Renoir. He didn't feel like he needed to be differential to anybody or the more established artists of the time. He was his own individual. Uh, it's kind of a sign of the respect that he had for women, however, um, the fact that when you look at the portraits, they seem to be painted with empathy and emotion. Some 40 years after his death, his daughter, Jean Modigliani, wrote some people nearly swooned at his suave, cultivated manner, while others found him an unbearable buffoon, boring, drunken, wet blanket. His first patron was Paul Alexandre, who was a young surgeon, a would-be art dealer. He ran a low-budget art colony of sorts for the desperate artists of the um, area of Montmartre, and he had a gallery in the rundown, in a rundown house on the Rue de Delta. And Modigliani would paint there rent free and then he would turn over his canvases to Alessandra for 10 to 20 francs, which is about two to four dollars at the time, and his sketches for about four cents. And uh, Alessandra would tell him if you could find someone to pay more for these canvases you can have them back. Uh, and he was constantly trying to sell Modigliani's work. Between 1909 and 1913, he painted three portraits of Alessandra, 
And his first conventional portrait kind of looked like it was staged with the uh, sitter having a hand on his hip. Uh, the last one that he painted on the right was done from memory. And this is probably the beginning of his first distinctively designed Modigliani-esque, and yes, that's a word in our, in our books, uh, with this rapid brush stroke, elongated features, blank eyes, uh, and that would become his trademark. Alexandra immediately recognized Modigliani's brilliance, but sadly, nobody else did. Incidentally, uh, Modigliani, uh, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, Alessandra's son wrote a memoir called The Unknown Modigliani, which you can still buy on Amazon now, as a matter of fact. Um, and it's an interesting book, uh, memoirs, from his father working with Amadeo Modigliani. Now, Modigliani entered seven watercolors and oils in the Paris Salon d'Automne exhibition, got accepted, and five works in the independent salon where the independent artists that became known as the Impressionists displayed their work. But none of them attracted very much attention in either place. All other than Alessandra, nobody seemed really interested in his art. So he was embittered, and at that point, he decides to give up painting, and he throws himself into carving stone. And he was inspired by a Romanian sculptor by the name of Constantin Brancusi, who was a friend and a neighbor. And Modigliani was convinced, he says in, in these words, Rodin and his fo followers had corrupted sculpture with an over-reliance on clay. Too much mud, he called it. He said real sculptors carved directly from stone. And so to do so, he would steal chunks of limestone to release them from these building sites. For an occasional sculpture in wood, he would swipe the oak cross ties from the new metro line being extended into Momacha. And from about 1904 to 1914, although the stone dust weakened his very frail lungs, he did carve a large series of highly stylized stone heads. With their impossibly long noses, the tiny pursed mouths, the massive works kind of combined the serenity of the early Renaissance tomb sculptures with that kind of exotic spookiness of the Eastern Island monoliths. He also drew and painted caratods, those load-bearing architectural figures. He did this almost obsessively. One limestone block that he had transformed into a kneeling caratod was just too heavy for him to cart away so he found it in a vacant lot, and it was left there until after he had passed. Friends rescued it right after his death in 1920, and it's now in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Unfortunately, his carvings were just too strange to attract buyers. This limestone head sold for $52.6 million at Christie's in 2014 another piece of abandoned stone that was left in a lot. He would use these caratots as giant candle holders, he said, in the disheveled studios where he often slept and worked. And when he would get kicked out for not paying his rent, he would leave them because they were too heavy to bring and go to the next apartment. He was impulsive. He was argumentative. He never had the inclination to change those social skills. He didn't need to because he never wanted to do commissioned portraiture, so he didn't have to be nice to anyone. In an early, port, uh, early portrayal, for example, of a fox hunting fresh French baroness, he changed her scarlet riding jacket to canary yellow, a color that she detested, and he insulted her and refused. she eventually refused to pay for the painting, so he tore it up. Many of his subjects were his friends and his acquaintances, his portraits of Jean Cocteau are this skillful blend of this soon-to-be Modigliani look, the mismatched eyes, crooked nose, elongated head, balanced on a pedestal neck, and that icy arrogance that he brings into every figure. One art historian said, you see Cocteau sitting there on his throne-like chair with one eyebrow lifted, ready to dismiss anyone's stupid remark. <laughs> 
The painting, another art critic said, has elements of caricature, but it exudes seriousness, uh, the seriousness of a royal portrait. Equally uh, revealing are the depictions he has of Paul Guillaum, who was his first serious art dealer. <clears throat> In a 1915 portrait, he looks very sleek and confident, has that fussy little mustache, one gloved hand holding a cigarette. And someone wrote at the time that he saw Guillaume as a savvy member of the avant-garde who was going to advance his career. But you also see his distrust for this cosmopolitan know-it-all in the way that he emphasized his cocky, tilted head, the fancy suit, the cigarette, almost as though he thought Guillaume were, was a pimp selling his work. Of course, it was his stylized interpretation of these melancholy women that are best known today. But what makes many of his portraits kind of linger in your memory is the unease and the obscurity of the faces. One art critic said, all are like her children, although some of these children have beards and gray hair. I believe that the world seemed to Modigliani like an enormous kindergarten run by very unkind adults. So this very vulnerable looking child, wringing her hands, the little girl in blue, in fact had just been scolded. He sent her out for a bottle of wine and she returned with lemonade. So the unease that's reflected in his canvases kind of uh, insinuated this burden that he had of his own poverty. He was continually evicted from a series of rooms in Montmartre. He slept in one franc per night hotels, train stations, waiting rooms, and very often old abandoned buildings. He managed, however, to maintain his elegance wherever his finances were concerned, and he would attract a number of lovers as a result, although his relationships tended to be very stormy and brief. Unlike his artist friends, he continued to refuse work, and his efforts to sell any of his work often ended badly. A painter friend recalls this about Modigliani showing some drawings to a dealer who had tracked him down in his studio. And when the dealer angled for a discount to take all of the canvases, Modigliani, without a word, picked up the pile of papers, straightened them very carefully, made a hole through the entire pile with his uh, paintbrush, threaded a string through them, and hung them up in the lavatory as he left the building. Aside from the small sum of money that his mother occasionally mailed from Livorno, he survived only on quick sketches of people in cafes that he traded for coins or meals or drink or the generosity of the women that he dated. Another friend remembered Modigliani's casual dignity as he worked at the Café de la Rotonde. He said, with the gesture of a millionaire, he would hold out a sheet of paper on which he sometimes went so far as to sign his name, like he might have been handing out a banknote in payment to someone who had just bought him a glass of whiskey, as if to thank him with this valuable sketch. Around Paris, he became known as a character, a notable character at that. An often remarked upon outfit that he wore was this stylish chocolate brown corduroy suit that he wore over a white unbuttoned shoot, suit shirt with a red bandana around his neck, and he would top it off with a large, uh, floppy, brimmed black hat. Picasso once wrote this in a letter, there's only one man in Paris who knows how to dress, and that's Modigliani. He wrote home regularly to his mother. He was unable to earn anything from his art, and he managed to get his mother to agree to give him a modest income so he could continue living in Paris. He was initially thought of to be very quiet by his fellow artists because he drank in moderation, he spent a great deal of his time at the Academy called Rossi. He was quite capable, incidentally, of making up to 100 drawings a day, but very few of those have survived. In 1906, this once revolutionary impressionist painter was finally accepted by the art establishment uh, like some of the other artists were, the avant-garde artists, um, and many of the collectors were looking for a little different inspiration, and that's why they were attracted uh, to the work of Amadeo Modigliani. 
However, at this point, when they were starting to recognize his style and the quality of his work, he was drinking heavily, using absinthe, smoking large amounts of hashish. His once tidy, classically outfitted studio was a disaster, always a mess, someone wrote. Worse yet, he said he took, the, uh, someone wrote, he took to destroying his earlier academic paintings, explaining that they were childish baubles done with a dirty bourgeois hand. Around this time, he was introduced to anti-Semitism, and consequently, he gravitated towards the Parisian Jewish community for fellowship and support. In 1914, after years of remission, his tuberculosis came back, and his drinking and drug taking escalated. Despite his illness and his addictive behavior, he was an enormous hit with women. He was handsome, but he had no morals. He conducted numerous affairs, often simultaneously. One of his friends said in a letter to Picasso, to say that he was loved by women is almost laughable, an understatement. All of his life, almost before one affair was over, Modigliani began another one. Many of his lovers were artists and models, such as Lunia Czechoslovakia, but the most uh, important and earliest uh, lover in his life was the 21-year-old Ukrainian poet Anna Akhtamatova. They both had a studio in the same building, and they met when Anna was on her honeymoon. <laughs> they conducted a year-long affair before she eventually returned back to her husband. He made 20 paintings of her. His reputation for drinking and drug excess earned him the name Modi, which was not just a shortening of his name, but also a pun on the French word Modi, meaning the cursed one. Some of his habits were outrageous. For instance, in social gatherings, he was prone to removing all of his clothing when he was drunk and standing on a street corner talking about whatever was on his mind at the point, at the time. How much of his behavior was genuine and how much of it was an act was written about very often in the letters of these artists. Many observers thought that it was just an act. Picasso was never impressed. He was famously quoted saying, it's odd, but you never see Modigliani drunk anywhere but at the corner of the Boulevard Montmartre. The most plausible explanation of his behavior lies with his tuberculosis. At that time, the disease was highly infectious and a highly infectious killer, spread by coughing or sneezing and greatly feared. If people had known he had this infection, they would have shunned him. And he was a very highly sociable man, so that would have been unbearable. And you could tell from the letters he wrote at the point that drunkenness and his behavior kept people at a distance. So his flamboyant use of drink and drugs explains away his weight loss, his erratic behavior, and his generally weakened demeanor. His excesses, unfortunately, became too much for his physique. And in 1909, he returned home back to his parents in Livorno to recuperate and recover. This was the last time he went to his old home. Soon he was to return to Paris, he said, like a moth to flame. When World War I exploded and the Parisian building boom also supplied him with plentiful amounts of stone and that had uh, come to a halt because things were changing in Paris at the time of World War I, he wasn't able to sculpt any longer. So it was difficult for him to find suitable stone. It became difficult for him to work and it was, the stone carving was now a little too demanding on his fragile health. He tried to join the army at this point, but he was refused because of health crowns. So instead of giving up, he returned to portraiture. That earned him a little bit of notice before he went on his wild binge. His models were all friends and acquaintances and people that he saw on and around town Paris. He continued to sell his drawings at the bars and the cafes in order to get food. In the process, he made many paintings of contemporary artists living and carousing around Paris, including such luminaries like Picasso and Diego Rivera. 
Around this time, he became involved with Emily Alice Haig, who wrote under the pen name Beatrice Hastings. She was an English poet and a critic about five years his senior. And like Modigliani, she made a life around drink and drugs, and she left a memorable sketch of their first encounter. She said, he's a complex character, a swine and a pearl, all at the same time. I met him in 1914 at the creamery. I sat opposite him with hashish and brandy to share. Not all that impressed, didn't know who he was. He looked ugly, ferocious, greedy. Met him again at the Cafe Rotonde. He shaved, he was charming. He raised his cap, he had a pretty gesture, blushed and asked me to come and see his work and I went. They shared an apartment together for two years during which time he was better cared for than any of the other women he had been with, but their tumultuous fights that were obvious from everybody who was around them, just about every artist at the time talked about the arguments and the arrests between these two, two uh, fueled by drug taking and heavy drinking, eventually ruined their relationship. One day, he even threw her out of a window when she was trying to castrate him. The affair was soon over. <laughs> but she was immortalized in a number of portraits. When the stormy relationship with Hastings broke up in 1916, he moved on to another woman, Simone Thoreau. They had a son together, but he refused to accept paternity. And to add to the air of melodrama that followed him around and hung over him, in his romantic liaisons, Hastings' new lover pointed a gun at Modigliani at a party and forced him to leave or he would shoot him. The tragedy that stalked Modigliani also touched Hastings. She would eventually commit suicide in 1943, gassing herself along with her pet mouse beside her. By 1914, he had established himself enough to have attracted the attention of another ambitious dealer, Leopold Zabrowski, the rival to the previous dealer, Paul Goyam. And Paul and Modigliani never really got along, even though uh, Modigliani painted his portrait many times. But the new pair, Zabrowski, uh, and he became friends and allowed Modigliani to use his house as a studio and a workshop. He also organized a number of exhibitions of his work. And Zabrowski paid Modigliani a small allowance so that he could eat. In total, Modigliani painted three portraits of Leopold Zabrowski. Now, he became a very wealthy man through his work with other clients like Marc Chagall and Maurice Utrillo. Sadly, Zabrowski lost all of his money in the crash of 1929, and he died in poverty in 1932. One day at the Academy Colorossi, where Modigliani liked to draw, he was introduced to a young girl by the name of Jeanne Aburtern. And uh, she was the daughter of the noted painter Achille Casmer Aburtern. She was 19 years old, beautiful, a willowy art student. She had pale skin, almond shaped eyes, long brown hair tied up in braids an absolute physical ideal for Modigliani. She was so reserved that Zabrowski's, Zabrowski's wife, Hanka, later said, I never recalled ever hearing her voice. He was 33 years old and reckless at the time when he met this young girl. They fell in love. They moved in together in a shabby apartment on the Rue de la Grande Chamée, where uh, uh, later, somebody wrote that in the apartment that they lived in, you could see the sunlight shining through the walls. Now, her strict Roman Catholic bourgeois parents were appalled when their beautiful, talented daughter left to live in sin with this notorious artist who was a failure. They cut her off uh, for any allowance as much as for her immoral behavior, in addition to the fact that he was a foreigner and he was Jewish. She was noted as being very quiet and self-contained most of the time, and he always called her my best beloved. 
a term that he never used for anyone else, and he always promised in writing that he would marry her, although he never really got around to it. Her love for Modigliani was apparently unconditional. No matter what he did, she even condoned his bar hopping and his excessive use of drugs. They loved each other, but their relationship was turbulent, very often violent, and they were frequently quarreling in the streets of Paris. They acquired this unpopular reputation for disorderly public behavior. Nevertheless, he made many soulful and loving portraits of her, and she in turn loved him unconditionally. Now around this time, 1917, he started painting a series of erotic nudes, which would be the pictures that he would be best known for. And the art dealer, Zabrowski, actually had some success in selling this work. One nude went for an astonishing 300 francs, but as a whole, these paintings were difficult to sell because they were very provocative. Modigliani's very good friend, the writer Frank Francis Carco, bought one of these paintings and hung it in his room, and then he told the story of that when his girlfriend came in to help him clean his home, she was scandalized by the painting hanging over the bed, and she said, it's either the painting or me. He kept the painting. <laughs> he had his first one and only one-man show in Paris, and it opened in 1917 in December, at the Bertha Wheel Gallery. She was a very progressive gallery owner. Uh, she, it, she was the Art Deco, um, the person who had the uh, Art Deco artist, Tamara de Lampica. It wasn't coming to me. She's the first one that showed the Tamara de Lampica work, so very progressive at the time. And he had these nudes shown in the Bertha Whale uh, gallery uh, in the front window, and there was a poster placed to, in the front to advertise this show. Well, now there was a chatting crowd that was noticed by a policeman from the station across the street. He wanted to know what was going on, and the crowd was looking at this poster. So the police chief investigated, and he was so shocked that he ordered the removal of all of the nude paintings. When Bertha Wheel demanded on what grounds he was acting, he said those nudes have b b body hair. He couldn't even say it, Bertha Wheel said. The exhibition was shut down within an hour of the time that it had officially opened, and he only sold two paintings. During the ongoing war, life and living in Paris became increasingly difficult. Zabrowski decided to move his business uh, and all of his protégés to the south of France. And his idea was that they might sell their work to the new tourist industry that was developing there. Modigliani was now uh, failing. His health was getting worse. And he really didn't want to move to the south. And unlike many of his contemporaries, he didn't really find a lot of inspiration in the harmony of Provence. He came from Italy, where there was nothing really exotic compared to where he came from in Provence, so he decided to stay away from the group. So instead of being inspired by the attraction of the landscape and the colors of the Mediterranean, he remained indoors and he painted portraits of some of the local storekeepers and their children. The South did have some influence on his palette when he visited there. But his work became somewhat brighter, but it didn't really change much. Most of his paintings were produced in Paris and sent to Zabrowski in hopes that maybe he could scrape up a little money from selling a few paintings here and there. Not long after this change uh, where Zabrowski was taking the artist down south, Amadeo and Jean separated for a while. But they were together again in time for Jean to give birth to their daughter who they also named John, uh, on November 19th, 1918. Now, on the way to register the baby, Modigliani got dreadful, dr dreadfully drunk, and he never recorded this child as his own, so Jean was officially fatherless. Within three months, Jean, the mother, became pregnant again. On May 31st, 1919, at the end of World War I, 
Modigliani was in, in uh, Paris. He rushed back to be away from the confines of living with Jean and their new daughter. And he lives alone in a studio in Paris. And throughout this time, Sobrowski had been exhibiting many of Modigliani's paintings and they were starting to attract a little attention. He was getting noticed as a promising artist. His work was now beginning to sell for respectable amounts of money. A particularly good successful exhibition was called French Art and it was held at the Mansart Gallery a department store in London in August of 1919. Modigliani had 59 works shown there, more than anyone else, including Picasso. And for the exhibition catalog, a novelist who was also an important art critic by the name of Arnold Bennett wrote an introduction in which he attacked the narrow-mindedness of British art and praised the new wave of young French artists, in particular Modigliani whom he said his portraits have a suspicious resemblance to a masterpiece. That affected the sales of his paintings as well, and he was starting to get more recognition. Uh, Bennett actually bought one of Modigliani's paintings, this one, uh, the painting of Lunia Czechoslovakia. He said it has a feeling of a heroine, uh, and that's what he felt that Modigliani was trying to convey in this paintings. And the critics were over generous about his uh, paintings, but they were trying to build up a following for him. Modigliani was thrilled with the reception that he got in England, but he was too sick to journey to London to hear the praise in person. Meanwhile, he and Jean are now re reunited in his Paris flat, and he got a suitable apartment from the sale of a few of these paintings at the Rue de la Grande Chemier in a building where Paul Gauguin also had lived. Unfortunately, it was at the time when he was collapsing increasingly due to his alcoholism and his tuberculosis. He felt that the end was near. Nevertheless, he continued working and drinking until the end. Two weeks into the new year, Modigliani, weak and emaciated, took to his bed with pain in his kidneys. And at some point he caught pneumonia, but Jean was so drunk and addled with drink and drugs that, and she was about to give birth, she was almost uh, nine months pregnant, that she couldn't really call for help. Modigliani was overheard whispering to her on his deathbed, follow me Jean when I die so that in paradise you will be there and I will have my favorite model. Together, we will share the joys of eternal life. Now, after a couple of days, some of his worried friends came to the apartment to see him, and they were shocked at what they saw. Modigliani was clearly delirious, complaining of bad headaches. The apartment was filthy, untidy, littered with empty bottles, covered with open sardine cans, dripping rancid oil, one of his friends wrote. And the neighbor immediately sent for a doctor who he writes declared the cause lost, but sent the now unconscious Modigliani off to the hospital. He died there two years later on a freezing wet January 24th, 1920, never gaining consciousness. He was 35 years old and he died of tuber tubercular meningitis. News of his passing swept through the art world. Hundreds of his fellow artists, including Brancusi, even Picasso, who we had been estranged at this point, attended his funeral. And he was buried at the Pierre Lachise uh, Cemetery in Montmartre. His tombstone says this, struck down by death at the moment of glory. His paintings were suddenly in high demand. Art dealers actually mingled with the mourners, offering to buy any of his work that they might be willing to sell. And one of his friends cast a death mask, which is a, a mask of his face from his coffin, made 12 copies and sold them to the crowds. At the galleries, the people who were holding his work at the time of his death raised their asking prices, some of them as much as tenfold, and the inevitable forgeries appeared as other lesser talents tried to cash in on 
Modigliani's sudden success, and now forgeries were flooding the market. We know now that about 30% of the artwork that's in museums that we thought were original Modigliani's are fakes. Unfortunately, his family in Livorno had very few originals, if any, so they never really benefited from his newfound triumph. After the funeral, his nine-month pregnant Jean was taken to her parents' house, but two days later, she threw herself out of a fifth-floor window, committing suicide and killing her unborn baby. She was only 22 years old at the time. Their 14-month-old daughter, Jeanne, uh, received, received all of the proceeds of the paintings, a collection that was initiated by Modigliani's fellow artists. She was adopted by Modigliani's sister and lived with her in Florence until her death in 1984. Eventually, Jeanne's family allowed her body to be disinterred and reburied with Modigliani. The young Jean Eberturn, who is this young woman, this woman's uh, mother, was a talented and promising young artist on her own. Has she not been overshadowed by Modigliani? Many art historians believe that she probably would have been more praised and appreciated today for her own work had she not been the lover of Modigliani. An author, an author who deals a lot in Modigliani said this about him in 1929. The life of Modigliani, the wandering artist, so often resembles a legend, it's difficult to determine fact from fiction. His modern women are seen by many as a symbol of sexuality and defiance, and their unapologetic stares and uh, poses all convey this woman in control, in control of their bodies, in control of their livelihoods. Ma uh, the models, incidentally, uh, earned relatively good money for being a model to Modigliani, which is a real statement. He actually paid his models more than he paid himself. What's interesting now is how much his paintings go for. Nukushe was bought by a Chinese billionaire for 170 Point four million dollars in 2015. A 1917 painting by Modigliani called Reclining Nude sold for 157 million at an auction in Manhattan. Cultural historians say that Modigliani had never been the darling of the modernist movement and many art historians looked him over. They considered his work to be not that important. However, the public always loved him. The paintings had elegance and refinement, and besides, people just love a good story. And this is the one we have at the Cleveland Museum and one in Oberlin. And that's the story of Monte I hope you learned something.